Hi. In this video, we're going to be going through how to use our studio, giving you a little bit of background into what each section of the program itself is doing and how you can use it within the scope of this course. It's a very powerful tool. There's a lot of things about our studio I will not be able to get to within this video but hopefully uh, you'll learn enough to get started and start becoming comfortable with using this program, uh, especially in a way that allows you to really explore the space, uh, allow you to learn a lot from interacting with. And that's one of the goals with this class, get you interacting with this concept of doing data science and doing analyses using this beautiful, replicatable, and powerful system for data science. So with that, I just wanted to first show you what the R GUI looks like. Uh, so this is the R GUI. It's not as pretty as R Studio. It can still run functions. So I can still type in a message and it will print. I can even do things like plot. That'll pop up a little separate graphics device and, and I can do plotting. So it, it works quite well just by itself. So RStudio is just an extension of these underlying features of R itself. So I'm actually gonna exit out of this. I'm not gonna save anything. And I'm gonna open up RStudio. So I, I don't currently have an RStudio icon on my desktop, but I do have it pinned to my start menu. Uh, you may need to, for your computer, just browse until you find the program. But RStudio will look like this if you installed it right. If you didn't manage to get it installed, go check out my previous video on how to install our studio. Now, one thing to note is I am using the latest as of the date, which is July 28th, 2022. And the current build is 554 with an R version of 4.2.1. So there may be small changes uh, on your system from these versions. Uh, I will say if you are using the EduPod, there are uh, a number of changes, just because that is an older version of our studio that is um, suitable for broad classes to use. So in this case though, uh, I wanted to start off by going through some of the options that I use typically. So uh, there's a number of options I change. Uh, this is simply just to get you started and doing something kind of um, interesting. So for this, I don't really change much about these basic values. You can see though, I have disabled restore the workspace on startup, especially for people beginning, that may be fun for you. And it allows you in case you accidentally close our studio when you didn't mean to. However, I will say that when you're running analyses that are meant to be able to be run by themselves, not intending to load data that you end up loading because it restored your previous session, that can be confusing. And so my general recommendation is actually to disable this. I consequently ask it to not ask me to save my workspace because I don't want it to save my workspace. If I close our studio, I'm, I'm saying that I'm going to start over. Um, however, I do always save the history. That way, in case something does happen, it crashes, things like that, I can go back and try to figure out what I did previously. In terms of other settings, uh, you can see what I have selected, but most of those are just default. In fact, I believe both of those tabs were completely default. For code, I do change indentation to be a little bit bigger, and that's just because I think it helps me read the code better when every time I press tab, it moves four spaces. It's obviously a preference situation, that's just my preference. I will also disable insert matching parentheses and quotes. Um, not everybody agrees with me on that one. I just find it less confusing if I have to type everything manually and I'm never letting R just try to match all of its parentheses and quotes. So that's just me. Uh, the, most of the rest of these I leave by themselves, uh, by the default settings. Um, you can check against your screen. Uh, I do really like the rainbow parentheses. It changes the color of the parentheses so that matching parentheses are the same color. It can really help when you are doing bad coding and you've added way too many parentheses. Um, it can especially help you debug those type of situations. 
I also do change some of these settings depending on what I'm doing. Whenever students are looking at my code though, I typically turn white space characters off and the indentation guide off. Personally though, I like them. I don't like not understanding what character's out of position. So the insert white space characters just shows a little indicator wherever I have a space or something that is otherwise kind of a hidden character inside the text. Uh, so I don't really change any of the rest of those. I'm not gonna go through everything else. Really the only other one I often change, and you'll see this as I present, is I will change the theme, usually to whatever suits me. I guess I have a blue background right now, so I could change it to uh, something that blends in, but we would all be blue then, so that will be difficult. So I'm just gonna leave it at the default setting, but this can be a really fun way to customize your experience. Uh, for the record, my favorite, is solarized dark. Don't know why, just my favorite. All right, beyond that, uh, this is my current pane layout. I'm gonna be talking about the panes next. So if you've manipulated this, you may wanna change it to my layout just so that it's consistent between us. Uh, the rest of the things, uh, the only other thing I'll mention from these settings is the terminal. Uh, so when I talk about the terminal pane, uh, the language that the terminal uses is dependent upon your operating system. So on this computer, I don't have the uh, preferred way of communicating with the operating system that I like, which is called Bash. Um, and so we won't really be showing that right now, uh, but if you do want to use Bash, there is a nice uh, software, there's a lot of software packages that you could use. But if you would like to, you can go to Git Desktop and install this program and it will actually, uh, I will have the link for you below, but if you install this program, it will help you. Okay, so with that, let's open up all the panes. So right now you'll see that my console is maximized. That's done using this button here. Um, so that's my console maximized, my source minimized. If I spread out, this is a little bit more what you've probably come to expect from watching me in other videos. So this is my source pane, my console pane slash a few other things, my environment pane, again, slash a few other things. And finally, my files and plots pane, I kind of use them interchangeably. Um, so that's, that's this one over here. You can click and drag all of these. That can be very handy whenever you're trying to visualize something that's too big for your screen. Um, but with that, let's just kind of break it down pane by pane. So if I go to my downloads folder where I've stored today's script, I can load a script into the source pane. And that's really the purpose of the source pane, not necessarily opening files, but it's where the code is stored. I store it here, I edit it here, and I save it from here. And then whenever I want to run code, that's when I bring it down to this console pane down below. And so in this case, um, I've started off with a couple of different examples. So the source pane here, I've got just a function that's generating some random normally distributed values. So r random norm normal. Uh, this is how many numbers is the mean and standard deviation. We'll talk more about that when we talk about functions. But when I run that line of code, first of all, we'll see that this appeared in the top right corner, the environment pane, and that's because that is this object, numbers, that has been created by this line of code. I can now type in that numbers, uh, and it will, by default, print the object. However, you may not know what I just did. So one of the things I just did was I put my cursor on this line of code in our studio. And then I just held down the control. If you're on a Mac system, you'll want to hold down the command button. And then I typed enter. When I do that, it is adding this code down into this bottom pane, into the console. Because uh, this pane currently is set to our script and not something else. It means that our studio need to interpret it as our code and 
sent it to R, which is this console. And so that's the power of the system, and that's the intended workflow. You start up here, if I want to edit things, let's say change the mean, I've changed it up here, but then when I run it, control, enter, and it comes down here, that's when it's ran. So I can check to see if this worked. Um, I can check it in a number of different ways. I could just call the name of the object itself. And so whenever you do that, R doesn't know what to do with it because you didn't tell it anything. For many objects, the default thing to do is to print it. And so if I just give this line of code, so you'll notice this time I'm giving it like a part of a line as part of a debugging process or kind of experimenting, experimenting with the code process. Um, I've just highlighted it, and if I highlight anything, that's going to just send that section to the console. So again, I'm going to press Control Enter. And when I did that, it sent just the word numbers to R, which then caused R to print out all the values because I didn't tell it what to do with those, that information. So its default behavior is to print. Um, other things to know about this, uh, I can visualize it. So there we go. So that one did get sent to the console. So we can see it down here. Again, RStudio is communicating with a separate program called R. So it, it had to send that code. But then when it did that, it did an interesting behavior. Just like if you go watch the, um, or the beginning of this video when I called plot, it created essentially a pop-up. But in our studio, that pop-up is located within this plots pane at the bottom right. And that's one of the nice things about our studio is I can even now sit here and play with this pane. It resizes things, which sometimes can be a little bit frustrating because like if that pane is too small and you try to call the histogram, it gets mad at you. It can't. It, it can't figure out how to plot things. It's not enough space to plot it. And so you get this big error message. But that's the idea. You're able to run code from the source down in the console. So one other thing I wanted to comment on about typing in code in this, this source pane is the ability to use tab. You're going to hear me talk about this all semester, but tab is essential for learning these skills because tab allows you to be lazy and to maybe not know everything. I mean, obviously I know everything, but um, no, no, I don't. I was lying. I really don't. So if I say forget the function for hist, the histogram, and I'm just like, I can't remember, is it histogram? Is it hist? Is it, I don't know, hiss? What I can do is I can start tape, typing hi. I, all of those options had hi in common. And then I can type tab. And so when I type tab, RStudio tries. It's not always going to work, and it's not always perfect, but RStudio tries to guess what you're talking about. And you may need to scroll around, but in this case, there's only two kind of default objects in R that start with HI. And so that is hist, hist.default, which is, I guess, what we'll be actually running here, and history. But in this case, I, I'm just trying to use the function hist. Okay, so cool. Now I've got the hist function pulled up. But what if I don't know what to do next? What are the arguments? What's the order of arguments? We're going to learn more about arguments later, but again, the trick for this pane and the trick for our studio is that we can keep pressing tab and it will pop up different things that we can try and add. So in this case, like if I press tab, again, I just had my cursor inside the parentheses this time, and I press tab, it pops up a list of different options or arguments. And so in this case, I want to do a histogram of the values inside of numbers. Cool. So that would actually work by itself. That's the same thing we just typed. Um, just this time I'm naming the arguments explicitly. But the really cool and the powerful thing is, you know, beyond just these really simple interactions, it can be contextual. So once I told it, hey, I've got a vector I want you to try to create a histogram of, our studio is now able to access even more information about the function and tell me, all right, well, here are all the parameters for a vector. Now, again, this doesn't always work perfectly, but 
for students and for people who are just learning. It's not just students, guys. It's all of us. The, the researchers constantly, I constantly am going through this process. Um, we can scroll through and we can see all sorts of information about the different arguments. And it's a really beautiful system. And so that's kind of how I, I, I like to teach this being uh, interacted with. So once I could see all the different arguments, I could be like, oh man, this histogram looks terrible, so I need to somehow find some argument that allows me to change the breakpoints between cells. Boom, now I know what argument, and I can specify, all right, I want a lot of bins. And that's what I get. And so I can see a, a beautiful histogram showing me my normal distribution. So that's the interactions I wanted to show. There's a few other features of this pane. Uh, obviously, we can save it. Um, you can even pop it out into a separate view. I occasionally use that, especially if I'm on a system with multiple monitors. Uh, we'll talk about source on save in a minute. Actually, let's just talk about it now. What I commonly use this for is having multiple scripts open at the same time. And so if I call this tutorial function, Dot R, I can make this source on save. And what I'll use that for is I will store custom functions in it. So I don't really need you to know how to do a function, but I can write one very quickly. And this will create a function called ABBA. And oh man, I can't think of the famous ABBA song that I know. Uh, but if I type in hello world, it's the default, it's the go-to thing to say. Now anytime I call the ABBA function, it's going to print off hello world. And what's kind of cool about that is it allows me to kind of store different information in different places. So in this case, this function, when it's sourced, it creates a file, uh, sorry, it creates this object because it's, it runs that whole line, that whole file of code. You'll also notice that it does this by sending code to R. So if I click that again, you'll see that it sources it again each time. Well, what's valuable is that it allows me to, instead of trying to type in all of my code into a single file, I can kind of compartmentalize things. So I can source this, and now, if I want to call this ABBA function, I can. It's compartmentalized in that way. And that's how I typically use it. I will often have two files open, one containing functions, one containing what I typically call my run code. Um, so there's a few other features. There is find and replace. It's very powerful. I use it constantly. It is, however, self-explanatory. Um, it's just like any other copy, find and replace function, like say in Excel or in Word or in things that you've probably come to get used to. Uh, there are a lot of powerful tools here that I'm not going to have time to go through in this video, but you are welcome to explore it. Go find other videos. Really explore this tool. It's, it's wonderful. Um, a lot of students like to use this button. You'll notice it does even suggest the hotkey for you if you hover over it for a second. So I recommend not really worrying about that button because it slows you down a lot of times. Uh, this one allows you to rerun previous code. This is kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. And finally, this is a new feature in RStudio that I really like. And what it does is it builds a table of contents of your code based on the presence of these matching uh, comment characters. And so you'll see that I have different sections for this video. So it's a really cool feature. I, I, I've come to use it a lot. Um, I am, however, going to close it right now just because there's not enough space because I have everything very large. I guess I can show you that interaction. If you press Control minus or Command minus, you can actually make it very small. That's hard for you to see. So if I press Control shift plus, I can make it larger and more easily uh, read from your end. All right, so I'm gonna zoom that down. Let go. I don't know why it's not, there you go. And let's continue on. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was this console pane. So most of the interactions I've already shown you, uh, that this is where we are running code. One thing, however, you can't see 
is that if you're looking at the bottom of the screen, notice it's currently changing. So what I'm doing, you can't see my hands, but I'm just pressing up and down arrow keys. And this allows me to scroll through the previous lines of code. It's a really, really handy feature once you kind of develop the muscle memory to use it. Um, and it allows you to kind of quickly check things or rerun lines of code uh, that you already ran. Now, I will reiterate, I do not recommend ever really editing code down here. Because you'll notice down here, it's not doing all this cool highlighting and coloring that allows me to like read the code really easily. So like you can see up here, there's color coding for comments, for values, for arguments, parentheses. It's all very pretty. None of that occurs down in this console. This is simply RStudio communicating with R. Additionally, it is where stuff is printed. So for example, with my ABBA function, which just calls the function print, Whenever I use that function, it is printing hello world, and that text appears in the console. Uh, beyond that, there's other few other features to notice. There is this number right here. That is my current version of R, which can be very important to be keeping track of. Um, but the thing that mm, students struggle with constantly, absolutely constantly, that even experienced people experience constantly, is the working directory. It's a very common issue to not be in what we call the working directory that we intend to be. So what do I mean by that? So the working directory, and I can kind of use this pane over here to visualize what my current directory is, uh, that is the, essentially the relative point in your computing environment that, you're, that R is creating paths from. So for example, if I tell R to write a file, and I don't like tell it where on the computer to write the file, by default, it's going to go into my working directory. And I can demonstrate that really quickly. I can say write a CSV file, it's the function. Um, actually, let me practice good behavior, um, good usage. I will write a CSV file containing the numbers one through 10. And I'm going to name that file test.csv. I'm going to make it actually test of console. Because we should always name our files using informative things. So there's some other arguments that I might be interested in using. Uh, but if I run that, we can see that by default, it created it within this home directory, which is actually on my computer, my documents file. And so there it is. If I wanted to, say, make it a different directory, I would have to change this path. So I could put this, I don't know, in miss. Oh, it can't, because I didn't type in my path correctly. To go from the current directory to somewhere inside of it, you have to type in this dot forward slash. And so it just created a file inside this miscellaneous folder. But that is something to be very careful to pay attention to. We'll have a, we have a whole page on the Canvas set up for helping you establish your uh, working directory. But just to demonstrate some of those uh, techniques, we can use our Studio. They have a really handy way for changing your working directory. So it's under Sessions, then going to Working Directory. And then I'm going to choose the directory. So this is my preferred way to do it. You can also set it to the source files location if your source file, so that's the RStudio tutorial script.r, is in the direction I want it to be in. Um, but in this case, I'm going to choose directory. And what's nice is this pops up a like explorer window that you're probably more comfortable using. And so right now, if I wanted to say change my working directory to my downloads file, I just navigate to that directory, that folder, then I click open. And I, several things just happened. And this is what's confusing the students. So one thing, this over here changed. So I've, I've changed the file view to my current directory. That's one thing. The thing that caused that to happen is that when I chose that, that folder, R Studio told R a line of code, and that line of code is copied right here. And so if I do that, if I, if I use that line of code, it's changed what my current directory is in this console pane. 
Um, so you'll notice I copied it up here because that's good practice. So if I ever want to redo this analysis, I can do that. And lo and behold, if I, if I write that test of the console, and this time we'll say test of console downloads. And then I refresh it, we can see it went into that folder. So that's the concept of your working directory. And so it's just the single line in your, term, in your console pane that causes tremendous difficulties for students. Um, and not just because it's kind of hard to type in these names. You'll notice even I made a mistake on it. And I've been doing this one a lot. It's very easy to mess up, but R does try to give you a lot of tools to help overcome that barrier. So finally, there is this clear console, this little broom symbol uh, that is quite useful. It just clears out the previous text in case you're getting lost and you're just trying to focus on your next step. It is, however, still in your history, so I can still kind of scroll through. But once you clear it, it is gone. So just be wary of that. So I'm just gonna erase that. All right, so the next uh, tab within this pane is the terminal. So the terminal is a way of communicating with your operating system, which is, I know, a lot of jargon. Uh, so the operating system on your computer, like the thing that controls uh, how programs work and like how to allocate memory and all sorts of things, it, uh, it has what we would call a shell. It's like a term used to describe how you're actually communicating with these operating systems. So Windows uses a different shell from Mac and Linux systems. Mac and Linux systems use Bash in most modern versions of those systems by default. You can change what your language is that you communicate with your operating system, but Bash is definitely the most common. Uh, so Windows users will have a different system. Uh, I, I did mention that you can get the Git um, desktop uh, download, which I have a link to down below, and that will allow you to actually change it so that you are using Bash by default. Uh, anyone who's using a Windows 11 system can actually just type in the word bash and it will enable uh, the use of bash. So I've already got bash installed on this computer. So when I typed in bash, it activated. Um, so I can actually now type in bash code. So here is some examples of bash code. Um, I'm not going to really talk through these, but uh, if I switch this to shell, our studio will now interpret this code as if it is the shell language. In this case, it's the bash. And so if I run this and I type in echo hello world, it prints off hello world because that's what the echo command does in bash. And that's the idea. I can even type in pwd, get the file path. I can type in ls, which lists all the files inside of there. Um, Bash is very powerful. We don't have time to go through it, but that is how you, yes, you, can get access to Bash today. It's a really handy tool, and I use it a lot, daily, in fact. Um, but that is all we have time to go through today. Background jobs is um, pretty simple to describe. It's simply a way of running scripts uh, in the background. So if I run this one, this one takes a little bit of time to run. You can see that it's running, but I can continue to do stuff up here. I can, I think, even do some terminal stuff. Yeah, so it's running in the background. You're not going to really use this too often in this class, but if you do have something that you want to kind of run in parallel with you continuing to work, that is a way to do it. And so you'll see it's still working. I'm going to kill it. Yeah, so I had some, a long thing called a loop that just ran a bunch of code in the background. That's why it took a while. Okay, so that's the console pane. Very useful uh, stuff. Just make sure you're editing your code up in the source pane. So the last two panes uh, are, are pretty big concepts. I am going to end this video here, though, and you can pick this back up in part two of this video. So thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope that helped.